Well, good evening and welcome to the Sixth Parent Guardian Workshop of the 2021-2022 school year. My name is Brenda Rachels and I am a school counselor with the CVUSD Breakthrough Student Assistance Program. I'm going to ask our translator, Maria Melendez, to share how to access translation for those who may need it. Hola, bienvenidos. Si ustedes necesitan um, una, eh, necesitan español esta noche, por favor, hay un globo abajo en su pantalla que pueden puchar y allí va a dar la opción de español y van a poder es escuchar toda esta presentación en español. And Shoshana, can you please show them the slide? That way we have the visual as well. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So the Breakthrough Student Assistance Program and the Caneo Schools Foundation are excited tonight to welcome Shoshana Wheeler. Shoshana is here tonight to share information on how parents can connect with their children. She will help us identify solutions in order to foster authentic relationships within our families. If any questions arise during the presentation, please enter them in the Q&A box and we will try to get through as many as possible. This evening's webinar will be recorded and we post it on the CUSD YouTube channel in the next few days. I'd like to now turn it over to Shoshana and let her introduce herself. Thank you. I'm actually going to go back to the original slide for just a moment to introduce myself. So my name is Shoshana Wheeler and I was a school teacher in this district many years ago. And then I became a school counselor. And um, now I am a parent educator and I also do professional development for teachers. And in all of these things, I have teach a um, foundation piece of my teaching, something called nonviolent communication, also called compassionate communication. And it's all about coming back to our hearts. So coming from that place where we are feeling compassionate and connected and um, that place where we really enjoy being. So what I'm going to teach you tonight is how to come back to that connected place when we might feel some disconnection occurring, which happens all the time in families. Family, parenting is the hardest job on the planet. And so I want you to know that I know that. I've raised two children. I think everyone else, um, I know that, um, I'm not sure about Brenda, but I know Shauna has children. And so we're all here having had the experience of having children and being with you in this journey. So I'm going to forward and talk about what we're going to be learning tonight. So we're going to be adding tools to your parenting toolkit. Really, it's really great to have a lot of tools that you can go to and for different situations. Something that's really important in parenting is to be able to distinguish a judgment from an observation. And we're going to be learning how to do that. We're going to think in terms of feelings and needs. So what are my feelings? And my needs are those values that are so important to me, really, really important to me. And along with those feelings and needs, we're going to learn how to give empathy to our children and to ourselves. So, so, so important. And, with, and we'll be talking more about that. We'll also be learning how to speak honestly, but without being offensive. So it's more likely that our children will be able to hear us and take in our words. And then the last piece is how to make requests and develop solutions. So that's a lot that we're going to be looking at tonight, but I think this is really, really important. This is a key to all of my teaching and I think it's really important to have. So I'm gonna move on. So in this slide, we're gonna be talking about the distinctions between two paradigms. So one is a typical family, and all of the sides that is the typical family is when we're triggered, when something's happened and we're a little bit upset. And in the no-fault family, we come back to our center, we get present so that we can actually be in connection with our children. So in a typical family, we tend, because our brains just do this, we tend to judge, criticize, blame, and label people. And so, I often ask parents, who in here enjoys being criticized? And no one ever raises their hand. And I go, I know no one enjoys being criticized, neither do our children. And yet so often the words that we hear coming out of our mouths 
are sort of filled with judgment and because we're annoyed. It's always out of annoyance or fear or one of those other feelings, but it's always, always disconnecting. And this parenting style is all about staying connected because when we stay connected, we are giving our children the best, the best means to grow this, to grow their uh, self-regulation system. When we stay connected with them, they are not going to get as triggered and it's better for their brains and it's better for our brains. So in a typical family way, my judge criticize and blame. And in what I call a no fault family, we're not looking to judge or blame, we're looking to problem solve. We make observations. So the distinction would be this room is a mess, clean it up now, or just this room is a mess. That would be the judgment. On the other side, the observation would be, you know, I see books and I see some papers on the floor, just saying what I see. Also without the word you in there, because whenever we put the word you in there, it's like finger pointing and nobody enjoys being thing, having somebody point their finger at us. Nobody enjoys that. So making neutral observations is so, so, so important for people. We can hear neutral observations and not get triggered. If we hear judgment or blame, we're all going to go on the defensive. It's just what human beings do. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next one. Oh, I actually want to read what we've got underneath here. So how many times do I have to tell you to get off that computer? That would be something that would be judgmental and critical of the child. On the no fault side, it might sound like I notice you've been playing this game for over an hour. And even the over is a little bit judgmentally, but I'm keeping it in there because it has been over an hour. So I notice you've been playing the game for over an hour. So there's no criticism in that. There's no place for them to get triggered or, or um, move away from us, to distance themselves from us. So that's a huge key in this kind of parenting, in this style of parenting, and in all parenting. The second one is in a typical family, we tend to think in terms of punishment. So when our children do things that we don't like, we, some, we tend to punish it or give them a consequence for that. Um, and it might sound like, if you don't get off that now, you'll lose all electronics for the rest of the day. And I'm sure many of you heard yourself say something very similar to that. And in a no-fault family, we think in terms of problem solving. So I know it's hard to stop, but our agreed upon time is up. Can you log off or do you need me to do it for you? And why I include that, do you need me to do it for you? Shutting off a video game that you're in the middle of is so hard. It's for me, it would be like turning off my favorite TV program in the middle of it. If somebody just turned off, got up and turned off the TV. I would not be happy about that. And our children aren't happy about that either. But sometimes if it's bedtime and they can't do it themselves, I might offer is it if it's too hard for you to do it, I can do it for you. So we're thinking in terms of problem solving. We're not thinking in terms of punishment. Okay, I'm going to move on. In the typical family, we tend to think in terms of right and wrong or good and bad. And I would call that black and white thinking. These kids never listen. How many times do I have to tell them that's bad? So on the other side, in the no fault family, we're thinking in terms of feelings and needs. So I'm feeling frustrated right now. I really want to be heard as the parent. And I'm looking over at my child and I'm noticing my child is really happy right now, having fun and engaged. So that's, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at what I'm feeling and I'm looking at what they're feeling. And I'm really connecting to what's important to both of us. I'm really wanting to be heard. This child is really wanting to have fun. And just to understand that helps us be connected. And we're going to be talking later on um, about how to phrase this in a way that is most likely to be heard. Let me see if there's anything I want to, else I want to say about that. I think that's enough for that one. In a typical family, we tend to think power over thoughts. And power over is any time that I'm going to 
assert my power and take control. Um, and a thought might be, if I'm not in control, who is? These kids have better listen to me. So, and I know as parents, there's so much that we need to do in a family. It feels like we have to power through it to get things done, but it always creates disconnection. So the cost of that power over attitude is actually very great. In a no-fault family, we are thinking power with, and we're also thinking same-sidedness. And I really, really like that, um, that term, same-sidedness. It means that I'm on my child's side and they actually have that experience. So instead of, if I'm not in control, who is, it might be, I love it when we can cooperate and work together because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to solve problems together. Yeah. And it can happen. I just want to assure you it can and it does happen. In a typical family, we tend to think in, think in terms of punitive use of force. So I'm going to use my power to punish. Stop that now and go to your room. In the no-fault family, we think in terms of protective use of force. So I'm not going to use my power to punish. I'm going to use my power to connect. But also, if I do need to use my power, I'm going to use it in a protective way. And so that might be in terms of safety. Um, it might be in terms of health. We want to use um, you know, our power in a protective way. So if my child is running out into the street, I'm going to say, stop, and I'm going to grab them. And that's a, I'm using my power to do that. And I'm always doing that for their safety. So I really work to not use my power over, but to stay in connection and use my power with, in terms of cooperation. And on this slide, it says, we all need to calm down. Let's take five minutes and then talk this out. So we're not looking to punish, we're looking to solve the problem. And oftentimes people need to calm down because we're upset before the problem can be solved. A problem can never be solved if we're upset. It's just not possible for the brain to do that because the part of the brain that finds a solution is this top part of our brain. And the part of the brain that's upset is the lower part of the brain. And when the lower part of the brain is active, the top part of the brain is dark, shut down. So, and you know this because sometimes when you get so mad, you can't even get words out of your mouth. And that's because you're in your emotional brain and not in your rational brain. So we're always wanting to calm down. Let's take five minutes and then we'll talk this out. We'll find a solution. And I wanna add here that, um, Children are always doing their best to meet their needs. So I'm always leading with um, a positive assumption of my child that I know in every moment they are trying to meet their needs just like I am. They might choose strategies that I don't enjoy or that might not be safe. And my job is to help them to learn to make a better, to find a better solution, to choose a better strategy. But in every moment, they're trying their best to meet their needs. Okay, we're going to move on. Um, in the no-fault family, you might say that love is conditional. We tend to withdraw our love when we're upset with our children. And um, it's just something that happens. I'm sure you, you've seen that in yourselves. When, when we get upset, we withdraw. And in the no-fault family, love is unconditional we recognize that we all make mistakes at times. And when we have that disconnection, we go back as quickly as possible to make the repair. And the younger the child, the sooner we need to go back to make that repair because it's so uncomfortable for them to be disconnected from us. With older children, we can maybe wait, in maybe teens, maybe wait a day and then go back and talk about what happened, what caused that rupture, what caused that disconnection, and then go back and talk about it and then see what we might do next time to help avoid that. Okay, so these are the primary distinctions between the two types of families. And now I wanna talk about what are the benefits of the no-fault family. First of all, there's so much more connection and connection is the key to um, 
to family life, staying connected. It's what we all cherish. It's so much more fun. Family members feel seen, they feel heard, they sense that they matter. Because when I am really listening to you, you have the sense that you're important to me, that you what you say matters. But if I'm just telling you what to do or that you've done something that I haven't liked and I've sent you to your room, you don't have, the child doesn't have the sense that they're important, that they matter to. What I love about this style of parenting is that children learn to problem solve. That, that they, while they might make mistakes, we can learn and we can, we can change our behavior to behavior that might be more appropriate, that might be, um, that we might enjoy more, um, but we can learn to problem solve. And we do that together. And every time, every time a child puts forth a solution, they're literally growing their brain. So this style of um, parenting is very much trying to develop that upper brain. Um, child develop, we also develop optimal self-regulation wiring. So in, in a typical style of parenting, children, you know, if we don't like what children do, we might yell at them and then they're crying and then they're upset and then they're in their rooms and they're really not in their rooms thinking how what they've done badly. They're mostly in their rooms thinking how mean we are as the parent. Um, and in the other style of parenting, when we listen deeply to our children and we give them empathy, it helps calm this whole system down so that their um, wiring for self-regulation is optimal. In the other style, when children grow up in a lot of chaos where there's a lot of yelling, where there might be abuse in the family, and I'm not saying that that's happening in our families, but in some families that does happen, it literally impacts how children self-regulate, and it reduces their ability to do so. So this style of parenting, this um, no-fault family, or what I would call compassionate style of parenting, connects with the child in a way that leads to optimal self-regulation wiring. So I think it's really, really important. So I'm going to move on, and we're going to talk about what do we need to do? What are the skills that we need to have to live in this kind of family. Number one skill is mindfulness. And this is for the parent to recognize when I'm tired, when I'm hungry, when I'm overwhelmed, when I'm starting to get upset. So there's like a level where I go over the edge and my upset, and then I'm just full on upset and I'm yelling and I'm really being big and strong in my yelling. If I can manage to back up just a bit before I go over the edge, I can recognize in myself, wow, I can feel my body, I'm getting tense. Ooh, my voice is getting higher, or louder. I can notice myself. And when I notice myself, I can then do something to calm myself down. Might be take a big breath. Always first, take a big breath. And I, and I would do this in the classroom all the time. I would go, I notice I'm feeling frustrated. I need to take a breath. And then we would breathe together. And it's really wonderful to actually state what you're feeling to your children. When you notice you're starting to get upset or angry or irritated or annoyed, if you can name that and then show them how to bring yourself back to regulation, that's such a wonderful learning for our children. So mindfulness is this huge piece of seeing myself in the moment. And um, sometimes it's a practice. It's completely a practice. Sometimes it's easier to do that than others. But it is a very big part of this style of parenting. So also the ability to calm down, recenter, and self-empathy. And I think I talked a little bit about that. So when I notice that I'm getting heightened, I have the ability to calm down. I can take that breath. I can say, guys, I need a minute. I can feel myself getting upset and I want to calm down because I know being upset is not going to help this matter. It never does. So I'm going to try to maybe go get a drink of water. There are lots of things that we can do to calm ourselves down. And then I'm going to also give myself self-empathy. Self-empathy is connecting with my own needs, my own feelings. Wow, this is really tough right now. And I'm doing this internally inside my own head. So I'm literally talking to myself. Oh, 
this, I'm feeling so frustrated right now. I just want them to listen to me. Can't they just listen to me? Okay, I need to take a breath and let it out. So then when I've gotten back to center, I can make some observations because as we said before, children can't hear those critical comments. It always creates disconnection, but those neutral observations, they can hear. Um, and we're going to also lead with empathy. So in Stephen Covey's work, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, his habit number five was seek first to understand, then to be understood. So I'm going to listen to my child first, and then I'm going to speak what is on my mind. And one of the reasons that we do this is when a child is in an agitated place, if they have no room inside of them to listen to me. There's just no room in them. They're filled up with themselves. If I can listen to them and have them empty out and really connect to what is going on with them, what happened, what are their feelings about what happened, what are they really wanting, it calms them down and it empties them out. And once they're empty, there's some space in them to hear me. It's just more effective. It's always more effective to lead with empathy. And then the last skill that we're going to um, look at today is making requests to develop solutions and strategies to meet our needs. So when we're in conflict with our children, it's never on the level of needs. It's always on the level of strategies that we're doing two different things that there's a conflict over. So I might want it done one way and my child wants it done another way. And that's where the conflict arises over the strategy. If we can get below the strategy to what's important to us, what is our value or what is our need, what's important to us in, our mo in this moment, we're much more likely to find um, a strategy or a possibility that we can both agree on. So getting to the level of needs is really, really important because that's actually the field of possibilities. That's where possibilities arise from and strategies arise from. Okay, this was a lot. So I'm gonna just get ready to move on. And the next piece is we're going to look at what are those basic needs that people have that in every single moment we're trying to meet. So I'm going to forward just a little bit to look at those. So these are some of our basic human needs. So all people, all humans require safety and trust. When I ask children, what's important to you? When I teach this, this to children, nonviolent communication or compassionate communication, the number one thing that they say is most important to them is their families. And number two are their pets. So family and pets are just so important to us. Community, friends, and belonging. Belonging, number, number two need. Safety, number one. Number two is belonging. And every moment, we're always looking to see, am I safe? Do I belong? Every moment, that's what our brain is doing. Um, help and support. To be heard, to be understood. So important to all human beings. The next one I think is critical for families, to be respectful to one another to have the sense that each of us matters in this family, to be considered and to be treated with kindness. So important in family life to maintain those things. Also so important to have fun and to have play together. For growing children, choice, autonomy and freedom is critical because they just don't have that much of it. All throughout the day, adults are telling them what to do. And, and all human beings want to have freedom and choice. And so children often feel like they don't have any. So as much as we can give them, gives them a sense of their own power. And then the last one is we all want to be capable and competent and skillful, and our children do too. And so often with skill with uh, schoolwork, when it's difficult, we're not meeting that need. We might not feel com uh, capable or competent. Then we get you know really frustrated and upset with our with ourselves. So these are just some basic human needs. I put these up that are most important in family life. There are lots of other needs that you will be actually receiving a list of feelings and a list of basic human needs um, when the, um, the recording is put up 
on the website. So I'm gonna go back and I wanna talk for just a moment about where feelings come from. When our needs are met, we have all of these lovely feelings. We're happy and excited and thankful. We feel friendly and loving. We feel content and satisfied. We feel curious and interested. When our needs are met, we have those feelings. When our needs are not met, we have those more uncomfortable feelings, sad or unhappy, angry or mad, scared and worried, surprised, confused, unsure, frustrated, embarrassed or shy. So in every moment when we have a feeling, the feeling is actually the mess, the messenger, it's not the message. The feeling lets me know whether I'm feeling pretty satisfied or happy. Oh, I know I'm going through life and my needs are met because of how I'm feeling. I know that. When I feel upset or mad or sad or any of those less comfortable feelings, ah, it's a wake up call. I've got some needs, some needs that are not met. And then I have an opportunity to find out what are those needs and what can I do to help my child meet those needs. So I'm going to go back. So that's sort of an underlying piece of this um, style of communicating. And the next one is, so in this style of communicating, there are three branches. The first one is self-empathy, connecting with myself. So I'm going to connect with what is alive in me in this moment. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? What do I need or want or value? So I'm connecting with myself. The second, and that's actually the trunk. If this were a tree, that would be the trunk of the tree. So important to stay self-connected. The second one branch of the tree would be empathy. I'm connecting with what is alive in you. I'm sort of on the back burner here and you're on the front burner. I'm paying attention to you. And then that second branch off the trunk of the tree is honesty and self-expression. So I'm going to communicate what is alive in me. So when I connect with myself in that self-empathy, I saw, oh, I connected with what I'm feeling, with what I'm needing. And then my honesty is actually expressing that. And we're going to have a chance to practice both of those. So I'm going to move on. So we're going to be talking about empathy for a bit. And empathy is just so important for staying connected with our children, for staying connected with everyone. So what I'm teaching you today is wonderful for your children. It's what every child wants, but it's also wonderful for every other relationship in your life. It's for your partner, your spouse, your work, people at work, your friends. Everyone wants to receive empathy when they're in a triggered place. It's just what human beings yearn for that we rarely receive because we were never taught to, to give this. We just weren't taught. So empathy is presence. It's putting ourselves in someone else's shoes just for a moment. It's putting our attention on another person rather than ourselves. We're imagining how they're feeling, what they're needing, and it helps them feel understood and cared for. And it helps them have the sense that they matter. It's so important. And I'm gonna give you a story about empathy. So when I was a school counselor, I got a call and Shoshana, one of our children is under the table and she won't come out. And my original thought is, well, if she's under the table, she's safe, number one. So I wasn't in such a hurry to get to the class, but I went, I went to the class and I saw this little girl under the table. And immediately I got down on my knees and I went under the table with her to be with her. And I saw that she had tears in her eyes. And I said, oh, you look so sad. She said, I want to go home. I said, oh, you want to go home. Do you want to be with your mommy? No, I want my dolly. I said, oh, you want your dolly. She said, you want to see it? I said, sure. And in 30 seconds, she was out from under that table. 30 seconds. There was no fight. So empathy just is so important. There's so much power in empathy. I really love that story. <laughs> so I want to talk for a second about what empathy isn't, because this is what we often do that just doesn't land as well for when people are upset. 
So fixing it, offering our good solution. Well, what you really should do is when people are upset, they actually don't have ears to hear that. Advising and educating. Well, you know, you could always, again, it's like fixing. And in, in the moment of being unhappy, nobody wants to hear it because they're not ready for strategies yet. Strategies come later. First, we just want to understand. Commiserating is also not empathy, though it does feel pretty good. I can't believe he did that to you. What a jerk. You know, that actually feels good to receive, but it's also not empathy. Telling your side or explaining or defending. Well, I just said that because it doesn't help the other person feel better. It, it just doesn't connect with them. It's defending ourselves rather than connecting to them. So it becomes more about us and less about them. And blaming never helps. Well, you shouldn't have whatever it is that they did. Never feel, they will never feel connected if you're blaming them, ever. And the last one is telling my own story. Well, you think that's bad. You should hear what happened to me. And the truth is there's, there's a time and a place to do all of these, just not when someone is upset. When someone is upset, they just want to be connected with. And sometimes empathy can be silent. It can just be our presence with them. And for teenagers, oftentimes they don't want to hear our voice. They just want a body to talk to. And we can just, you know, nod our heads and understand what they're saying. And sometimes they do want to hear the words. So we're going to look now at some empathy frames. They're really useful. And you're going to get all of this in the handout. You're going to get all three things what empathy is, what it isn't, and the empathy frames. And I recommend that you put it up on your refrigerator. So the next one, these are empathy frames. So these are phrases that we can say that are connecting. So are you feeling upset because you really wanted more time on the computer? Yeah, wanted to have fun. I can imagine you feeling really frustrated right now because um, you wanted your toy and your brother took it. So you wanted some choice in there. You wanted some choice whether to share that, that toy or not. I'm guessing you're feeling worried because your paper is due in a couple of days and it's not done yet. And so I'm guessing you're feeling worried. I'm going to always put in the feeling first and then the need. And the last one is, um, I bet you're feeling irritated because you really wanted your friends to listen to you. So I'm really struggling to find, so we're much better with feeling. We really have a pretty good feelings vocabulary these days, better than we used to. But what I noticed is that people don't really have a very um, embellished needs vocabulary because we don't speak like this. We don't often connect with what's important to people, what they're valuing or they're needing. So um, over here, we have our basic human needs and you're going to get a much larger list of them. And, you know, just to keep them available so you can learn what some of these words are and to more easily connect in this way. So I wanna go back one. So when we're connecting with someone who's distressed, these are the feelings that we're connecting with. So we can look to these feelings, go, oh, like he looks really scared right now. Oh, I guess you wanna you want feel safe or you look really confused, are you wanting some clarity? So we're always going to choose first a feeling and then a need. Okay, so I'm gonna go back. And what I would like to do is take a minute and give you an example of this with Brenda. So the example is going to be, Brenda is on the computer and it is, time for her to get, time has gone by, it's time for her to get off. But before I make the request for her to get off, I'm actually going to just connect with her. So, um, so, I'm, so it would be, uh, so Brenda, I'm noticing that you're still on the computer. Yeah, I'm playing with my friends right now. Well, that must be fun. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I'm so glad that it's fun for you to play on the computer. So, Brenda, do you feel connected to me? Yes. Yeah. So I haven't said anything that is disconnecting. I also haven't made any requests right now, nor have I spoken what's true for me, my own honesty. So, 
So this is, so I'll actually want to do another one with you, Brenda. So I want to do one where you might, um, so let's say that in a family, your brother came into your room without asking, and you're really upset about that. So you're coming to me and you're going, mom, he came into my room again. So I wonder if you could say that. Mom, John came in my room again and he didn't knock. He just came in without me saying he could. Is that so frustrating for you, honey? Yeah, I keep telling him not to do that. Yeah, I can imagine. Are you really wanting your privacy? Yeah, because sometimes I'm not dressed or I'm on the phone. Yeah, so it's really important to you that he knocks first. Yeah. So, Brenda, do you feel connected to you? I feel like you're hearing me. Yeah, and that I'm, do you have the sense that I'm on your side around this? Definitely. Yeah. And so then the next step would be to bring the two together. And we're going to hear from John what's so important to him because he has big needs around being with his sister. He really probably really wants to be with his sister. But there are times when she's not really enjoying that. And we don't always get what we want. But we can work that out in a, um, you know, we can problem solve that when we understand what his needs are, and what her needs are, we can work together to solve that problem. So those, that's a bit on empathy. And I want you to know it was a very small piece on empathy. So there's, you know, there's a lot more to it. I just want you to know that. But, and this is still, you've gotten a lot tonight that you can work with. The next piece is going to be honesty. How do I express my own honesty? So we're going to express honesty by first making the observation. So I'm going to, um, so it's, when I saw or when I see or hear um, or when I felt, because it's data that's coming in through our senses. Our observations are just data coming through the senses. So it's, there's never evaluation mixed into that. So it's very clean. So I notice that there's papers on the floor. I see you're on the computer for over an hour. Um, I notice the dish is still on the table or the dishes on the table. I see shoes at the front door. So it's what we see or what we hear. Nothing else included because people can hear that. So when I see you're here. So Brenda, I, when I see you on the computer still um, after 10 o'clock, I feel concerned and worried. So that would be my, be my feeling, what I feel or what I felt in the past. And then the next part are their needs. Um, I feel concerned or worried because it's past 10 o'clock and your rest is so important for your health. So that's the value is her health and her safety. And then here comes the request or the problem solving. So it can be three things. I can ask for some positive action. Would you be willing to or... Which um, I actually don't want to say, would you be willing to get off the computer? Because it's not really a choice for me. So it's more a problem solving. What can we do that? So Brenda, I see you've been on from, um, it's after 10 o'clock and I feel really worried. I'm really concerned for your health and your well-being. So um, what can we do that will work for both of us in regards to the computer right now? So that might be a question. Or I might want to go for a connection. Honey, can you tell me what's important to me? So Brenda, could you tell me what's important to me right now? I want to be able to sit on my computer and hang out with my friends. Yeah, I hear that, honey. So I, and I, I really know that. And that's what's important to you. And I'm asking if you could tell me what was important to me. That you, you want me to get off, but I don't, I'm not ready to get off yet. Well, why do I want to get off? What, why, for not just for any reason, what am I concerned about? Because you want to make sure I get good sleep and that I'm healthy. Yes, that's exactly why. Thank you so much for hearing that. So, and then another one would be for their honesty. So how do you feel about what I've said, about that it's time for you to get off? I don't want to get off. I don't like that. Yeah. So, and are you frustrated about that? Yeah, because I don't get to see my friends very much. Yeah. So, um, so Brenda, we actually have agreed on a time and 10 o'clock was the time. And so I'm asking you to keep your agreement and, and do you, how much, and 
10 o'clock is our agreed upon time. And it, so if he, if this person was playing a video game or if they're to complete a conversation, I would actually not make them get off in the moment because that's incredibly disconnecting. I would say, how much time do you have to complete this conversation? How much time do you need, Brenda? Probably like 45 minutes. You know, honey, that doesn't work for me. Okay. 10 o'clock and we've agreed on 10 o'clock shut off time. So that's an agreement that we have. Okay. How much time do you need to complete this conversation? Probably 20 minutes. You know what, honey, that still, that doesn't work for me. I, I, I would feel comfortable with five or 10 minutes. Okay. Does that work for you? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I'm valuing what's important to her, but I'm also valuing what's important to me. And, and if you notice, it doesn't escalate. It doesn't have to escalate. Um, there can be a place where we can meet, where we can both meet. And I think you just saw that occurring where I kept my stand and she actually kept hers, but we were found a place that was comfortable for both of us. Okay, so I'm going to, Go to another slide. So this is what it might sound like. I notice that it's after 10 and the computer is on. I'm concerned that it's getting late. It is really important to me that you're well rested and that our agreements are followed and that we stay connected. So can you tell me how much time, more time you need to finish what you're doing, which is what we just did. And we came to, you know, between five and 10 minutes. Can you wrap it up in five minutes, honey? Brenda, do you think you could wrap it up in five minutes? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate the cooperation. So let me see. So this is the perfect place. So um, so that's the honesty. Let me see if I have one more. Um, I don't. So so what you've learned tonight is you've learned to make observations, you've learned empathy, and you've learned how to speak honestly without offending. I am not telling her that you um that you're so uncooperative, you never listen to your mom. I'm not going there. I'm connecting with her and I'm connecting with myself and staying out of the judgment place. And that always leads to better connection. So this is the end of this presentation. And um, what I'd like you to think about are what did I learn from this workshop? What are my takeaways? What skills can I use at home and what needs of mine were met by being here tonight. So we're now going to move to the question part of this evening. And you um, participants came, came in with a lot of really great questions. So Brenda, do you wanna start those questions and what slide would you like to be on or should we turn this off now? Um, we can turn it off now, that would be great. And we okay. have been getting, we got a lot of great questions when they registered, but we've also got some great questions that are still coming in. Um, so yeah, let's get started. One of them was um, going back to when you're feeling frustrated. So as a, as a mother or father, uh, you're asking your child multiple times and, and um, you've, you've told them to get off or do something and they're not listening to your directions and you've told them multiple times and then you find yourself raising your voice and you yeah. don't wanna be doing that. Um, but also they're struggling with trying to take that step back and still be patient. Um, so any suggestions on what they can do on their part to help them kind of get back in that, that top break? Absolutely. So thank you. I, you know, after you've asked twice, it's like you're already, you know, we, we've gotten to our boiling point. And so we want, we don't want to get to the boiling point. So if we're asking them to get off the computer because our agreed upon time is up, first of all, we want to give them a five minute warning because everybody needs that kind of warning. So it's five minutes and then you go in. So honey, you've got five more minutes and then your time is up. And then five minutes later, I come back and I go, okay, so our time is up. It's time to get off the computer. And actually, before this, before, even before this, I would have said, because it's very hard for them to shut off the computer if they're in the middle of a game, it's always best to end when they finish that particular level because there's some completion. To leave in the middle of, a, of, a of, of playing the game is very hard. So before... 10 or 15 minutes before it's time to get off, 
I might ask, how much more time do you need to complete this level? And then I would say, when you get finished with this level, it's time to turn the computer off. It's just an easier way to go about it. It's very hard for them to leave in the middle of the level. And so if I don't do that, if I say you've got five more minutes, and then I come in and I go, you've got five more minutes, or how much more time do you need to finish this level? Um, so Brenda, I'm going to go to you. How much more time do you think you need here, Brenda? Uh, 25 minutes. Yeah, sweetheart. That's that's. I don't have that much time. So um, I know it's really hard to turn off the game midstream, but you're, a lot of time is up in five minutes. Okay. And I like what you brought up. I had to learn that with my kids the hard way with the feeling of completion. So mm -hmm. taking that and count with the game levels. Um, yeah. Really important. Time. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. That. And so then, so five minutes has gone by and I go, okay, sweetheart, it's time to turn the computer off. And what do you say? Okay, mom. Well, and what's realistic? Okay. Um, so sometimes I, they, they might say, okay, they say, just five more minutes. I go, honey, our agreed upon time is up. Can you turn it off or do you need me to log off for you? Because sometimes it is so hard for them to pull away from the computer. And they're going to go, no, 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 I can do it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. But, and to not offer it in a snarky way that you know that this is a really hard thing that you're asking them to do. They're totally engaged in something and you're asking them to stop doing what they love doing. And so it's really hard. I want you to know how hard this is for them. I mean, computer games are very addictive. They just are. We know this. And so we have to go in and be the adult. It's time to log off now. Can you do that yourself? Or do you need me to help you do that? I think that's a really fair thing to say. Great. So here's a question. Um, if you were beginning to develop a no-fault family as your children are entering their tween teen years, why don't you know if it's too late? And then any additional considerations based on the kids' age and phases that they may be going through that you could give additional insight with that? Abs absolutely. Thank you so much. So it is never too late because it's just treating your children the way they want to be treated. So um, what I often say is this kind of parenting is actually a following the golden rule, but it's the golden rule for children as well. So, uh, I mean, it's often that we don't treat our children the way we would want to be treated. How many, how many times do you go to your friend and you say, get off that now? <laughs> it just wouldn't happen. So when we maintain our, our respect to our children and recognizing that they're always doing their best to meet their needs, and sometimes they need help with that because the strategies they choose aren't wonderful. We're there to support and help them. So it's never, ever too late because this is how your children want to be connected to because they're humans. Um, they might not trust you in the beginning because it's very different than how you used to parent or than how you did before. So it might take time for them to trust your good intentions. But if you are consistent and if you say, you know, I want to do this over again, I don't like how I spoke to you. Let me try that again. Wow. They will be on your side all day. So, you know, just being honest and being vulnerable with our children goes really far. Does that, does that answer that to you, Brenda? It, it does. It really okay. does. Um, okay. And then here's one. Um, how, how do you help a 12 year old recognize their mistakes that they're making on their own and help them to own those mistakes Yeah. Um, so that they're able to change or rather improve your responses? And I know you've kind of mentioned that, but specifically feeling like this child's kind of putting herself in this situation and just it's everyone else's fault or just no type of um, ownership. Yeah. So when children have been criticized a lot, there's no place in them to for apologies or to recognize it or to own their mistakes. They just don't have an internal fullness. So we are really going to work hard with this child to, um, to not voice it as a criticism, but to voice it as an observation. So 
a mistake might, so a mistake. So what I heard in this question was that maybe they're snarky with you or maybe they're disrespectful with you and they're not recognizing that. I think that's a little bit of what I heard. Mm -hmm. So part of this is us. So if some of a child is snarky or disrespectful or attitudinal or rolls their eyes, 100% of the time it means that they're irritated or annoyed. Oh, that's what it means. And so we can either be insulted by it and take that personally, or we can be bigger than they are. And I really hope that we can be the adult in the situation and offer empathy. I notice that you sound really annoyed or irritated right now. Can you tell me about that? And, and just that, We'll get it. Well, yeah, you never listen to me or, oh, you really want to be heard right now. Yes, I want to be heard. Tell me what's important to you. And then you'll listen. And then after they've, she's been totally heard, she might have some space to hear you. I'm hoping that she'll have some space to hear you. Usually after somebody's been very, has been well heard, there's more space in them to hear you, especially if we're not blaming or criticizing them. Okay. Would you apply some of that as well? Say if there was a child that has a habit such, you know, based on their age, like mm -hmm. maybe some sucking or something like that, where they are not wanting to make any changes or not yeah. seeing the importance of it. Yeah. Some type of habit. Yes. Yeah, so this is really, really hard because um, it comes to um, autonomy here. So we have to look to see, is this habit unhealthy for the child? And then we also have to really help the child see that it's unhealthy. Just our saying so will probably not be enough. So you might have to go online and find some, you know, do some research. I think going online to do research is really, really important. So find out why we don't want to spend six hours on the computer, or six hours playing, playing video games. And you can look to see how it impacts the growth of a child's brain. And when they read that, they're more in alignment with you. So regarding a, a, a habit like that sucking a thumb, which is a really, really hard habit to break, you almost have to wait till they want to make the change. And then we're there to support them. Um, but if it's a habit that is, um, you know, if it's a habit like that is so against their health, then we need to show them why we're asking to help them change this habit. Okay, thank you. It's because, you know, it just won't work to have power over them. They'll just do the habit right. not around. That makes sense. They have to want to They have to have to their intrinsic. Um, I know we got so many questions. Um, how about a child that does the minimum needed to get by at school? Is there anything that we, and just in life in general, how can parents have those conversations to motivate them? Yeah. Oh, that's such a great question. So my guess is that if it's interesting to them, the child, whatever's interesting to the child, they get fully engaged with, but schoolwork is not so interesting to them. So... This is hard. Uh, first of all, we hope that we can, we hope that it can be interesting. We really hope that there can be some intrinsic value in the work for the child. Um, also, we can have like a minimum standard in the family. And, 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 and I would actually have a conversation with the teacher about what is the minimum standard um, that you, that you're accepting and but there's also this piece that, you know, we always want to do our best. And school is the place for learning. So my guess is this child is not connected with the value of what they're learning. When they can become connected with the value of what they're learning, why this will be so important in their lives, they're more likely to have more engagement with it. I think just seeing the importance of it is like, is critical. And now kind of switching gears a little bit with just maybe a high school senior that's getting ready to graduate. They're looking at colleges, finances, trying to, how do you steer that conversation? Because, you know, we're getting into that autonomy and independence. As well. Yeah. So I read that question and I go, this is a tough question because as a parent, 
we have a larger view than our child does. We just do. It's just how life is. Much more life experience. Our brains are fully developed. Theirs aren't. But at age 17 or 18, they do have very strong autonomy needs. And so they might, you know, they might have a desire for themselves that we think might not be the best direction. So we're going to have to really explain to them why our position, we're going to have to explain to them why we think this other way would be better. And and they might agree with us or they might not. But at 17 or 18, you know, the choice of the college is really going to need to be up to the student. They're going to be there for four years. So it's really going to be up to them. Now, if the family can't afford a particular school, that's, you know, that's the limit right there. I really wish we could send you to the school. We don't have the financial means. If you can find other ways, awesome. We'd love to have you go. But right now, our financial means aren't there. And children understand. The students understand that. It's sad, but they do understand it. I'm hoping to get in two more. Find the financial means. <laughs> um, how about sibling rivalry, where they're always trying to compete and put each other down? So you got that family dynamic. Out. Yeah. Um, I go back to the family values again. So even to sit with your family, to make a list, what is important to us? What are our values in this family? Do we treat each other with kindness and respect? Do we value each other? And so when our children are not following those values, we say, you know, I hear words that don't follow our family values. Let's think if we can see some, say some different words or let's see what's going on here. To go, to look underneath what is causing this. What, you know, what are the needs that are on the table that aren't being met? Um, there's all, and then also to try to foster some kind of connection, some kind of teamwork that they can do together. So a little project that they can work together on is always helpful. But um, really living into the values that we have as a family and really speaking those values and noticing them. I, you know, when a class, when I was in the classroom and I saw children following the values of, of our classroom, I would make this big heart and there would be lots of puzzle pieces. And we would, I'd say, oh, I just saw cooperation, go fill in a puzzle piece. You can do that in your families as well. Have a chart where they're, you're just, or even just tallying, wow, I saw so much cooperation in tallying. And just, you know, and then after a month of, you know, where you filled in the heart or you've gotten, you've seen cooperation 30 times, go celebrate as a family. So we're really focused on what we want rather than what we don't want. Okay. And one last one. Um, someone has a five-year-old who likes to, um, has little kind of cruel outburst comments to her family, even mm -hmm. though she's not treated like that and she doesn't show any remorse when yeah. And they express that they're hurt. So any tips on that? Yeah, I would go back to the values. I'm sorry in this family, that's not how we speak to one another. And it's not good for you to talk to people like that. It's not good for your own heart. But really what I want to connect with even before that, I would connect with what is she so upset about? So I would say, honey, you sound really upset right now. I'm wondering what happened that you are so upset. And then after she's emptied, I would say, so I want to talk about the way you expressed your anger. I'd like to find better ways for you to express your anger because you will lose friends if you speak this way to people. And I want you to be able to have friends. So really work on, on appropriate ways of expressing anger, really important. Thank you, Shoshana. Yeah. Um, we're getting ready to wrap up, but you've given us some great framework to work with. Uh, I what I'd like to do is put my uh, contact information. Perfect. Uh, but I'm not able to do that. I'm not sure why. There it is. So this is my contact information. So I'm a parent educator, parent coach, facilitator of restorative dialogues, which is when there's a, dis a big disconnect in a family, I help families come back together. Um, my website is Connecting with Compassion. One of the classes I teach is Families by Design, not by Default and my email and my phone number. Thank you Perfect. so much. Thank you. Yeah, and we're gonna have everything um, sent out. Hopefully we can get a copy of the PowerPoint as well as the resources and we'll send those out to the families. It's great information. I feel like everything you said, you can bring right back around no matter what the age group. So no matter the age. Um, 
As we conclude our presentation tonight, we want to thank Shoshana Wheeler for sharing information on how to connect authentically with our families and have that family harmony that we all are striving for. Um, we also want to thank our wonderful interpreter, Maria Melendez, who has been working very hard this evening as well. So thank you, Maria. Um, the, like we said, the video presentation will be posted on the CVUSD YouTube channel in a few days. When I send out that information with the resources, I'll also be sending you the link if you'd like to watch that again. Uh, we also want to thank you, all of our parents and guardians this evening for attending tonight's event brought to you by the Caneo Schools Foundation and the Breakthrough Student Assistance Program. We look forward to seeing you at our next event, which will be the last one of the school year. So enjoy your spring break. Have a good night. And thank you again for being here.